Hi there everyone, I hope I find you well. It's really great to see you. I'm Jenny Kirk and come with me today. We've got a review and comparison of one of the favourites in the Backman range. Certainly this was a big seller when it was first introduced and it's recently been re-released with a different running number but the same ornate livery. Yes, that's right. This is the SECR C-Class locomotive in that really, really lovely livery. And this comes due to the incredibly generous donation of Tim's Trains and also in association with the channel sponsor train o -matic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. I'm really excited to show you this model, so without further ado, come with me and let's take a closer look. <laughs> This is the locomotive. It's the Bankman C-Class that came out in, I think it was 2013. It's kind of hard to believe that it's been seven years since we first saw these locomotives hit the shelves in the hobby shops. But it certainly is a really beautiful model. And back then, it sold out really, really quick. In particular, in the really ornate SECR livery that you see here. Now, I spoke to uh, one of the people on the Backman stand at, I think it was Alexandra Palace last year, and he actually mentioned to me that originally when Backman brought out the locomotive in this livery, they very much found themselves testing their toe in the water. Pre-grouping liveries back then were actually a lot more unusual than we see now. The tampo printing processes had reached a point where it was actually feasible to undertake a really ornate livery, such as what you see here. But they didn't know whether they would sell. And actually, whereas most limited editions are of 500 units and up. These, even though they were in the main range, he confided in me that he believed that Backman had only made in the region of 300 of them. And that might have gone some way towards explaining why they sold out so, so quick and actually started changing hands on well-known internet auction sites for, well, at the peak, I saw them change hands for about £550, which is just absolutely stupid. They have come down a lot since then, but finally, after, well, seven years of cajoling, Backman have finally been persuaded to bring out this livery again. It's not an exact duplicate of the original release, but it is certainly pretty close, and I suspect that they've reused a lot of the Tampo printing dies that were used on that initial locomotive release. It's got a catalogue number of 31-460A, the A suffix, of course, denoting that this is a rerun. It does have a different running number, and this is number 583, the previous release being number 592, which is actually the preserved example at the Bluebell Railway. Now, a little history of these locomotives. They were designed by Wainwright, and they were brought out actually as a goods locomotive for the SECR. They had trialled some of the locomotives that they had from their constituent companies, such as the South Eastern Railway, to try and figure out what was the best design. And the locomotive that won through was one that formed the basis for the design for the C-Class. Now, there's actually quite, they were quite numerous with uh, over 170 of these examples being built. And uh, they lasted pretty well. Whilst there was one withdrawn as early accident damage, an awful lot did actually make their way to the Second World War, where by rights they would have been due for replacement. But of course, wartime measures meant that that wasn't actually possible. So they ran on through the Second World War, and then faced with all of that deferred maintenance and wear and tear, the withdrawals really started in earnest. But they did survive long enough for one example, number 592, to survive as one of three locomotives being used as a works shunter. And that was the locomotive that was chosen to pass on through into preservation and is still with us now. 
looking to the actual release that Backman have brought us here, it's got everything that you will remember from that initial release. And if you're like me, you probably saw it in the catalogue and thought, I must have that. And I guess an awful lot of people did, but with only 300 models to go round, it's hardly surprising that they sold out. Delivery application is every bit as sharp and slick as we had back then. All of the lining is really, really crisply done. And uh, there is, really isn't anything to show that's put a foot wrong on this. The dome on this is kind of painted in this gold paint. It's very reminiscent to me of Humbrol number 16, which was a uh, gold metallic paint. Now, Humbrol have changed the recipe and the new version is not a patch on the old, but it, it looks painted rather than actual brass work. If any of you have seen the H-Class from Hornby, you'll see that on there, they've got an almost mirrored metallic finish uh, dome, which really does look something special. And Bankman haven't gone that route with this. That said, it isn't actually a major detraction. And it does really actually quite work. And I suspect that a uh, metallic dome that actually looks like it's been covered with some kind of brass foil would be very expensive. And these models have come through to the market at a, uh, a price. Well, I've seen them on sale for around the £189 mark. Yes, you heard that right. £189. That is quite an increase from the original RRP, which from memory, I think um, the RRP was about £74.95 and they could be had for £69, which seems almost giveaway prices uh, in this day and age after we've had seven years of massive price rises. And um, it has to be said, my thoughts were that the original release was underpriced. At £69 it's doubtful that Backman actually made any money from it and in all honesty with you they probably could have easily charged £90 to £100 and not stirred too many feathers and still sold out the entire production run. But for me it does feel like the price has hiked an awful lot but you know we'll see how that reflects in the scores. We've still got that moulded tender load on the top and I'm just feeling there whether that comes out. I never actually tried this on the previous one. It's difficult to tell whether that is removable or not. It does feel pretty well in there. Yes, it is removable. I can feel it. I can feel it trying to move but it just doesn't want to come out. I guess if you want to remove that coal load to reveal the underside either to model a locomotive that's uh, low on fuel coming to the end of its run or wanting to refill it with actual coal, then you can get that out. I'm, I'm not going to try too hard. The actual modelled coal lump there is pretty nicely done, so I'm quite happy to leave that be. Looking into the cab, this is an area that was oh so special on the original release as well. And you can see that we've got all that separately applied detail and the actual separate tampo printing in there is truly exquisite. It really is a beautiful cab. It does appear to have a few extra embellishments as well that the original did not have. And we're going to come to that and I'm going to show you what's different between the two in a moment. But for now, it does look really special in there. The front of the tender too is worth a gander because that too has got this exquisite lining on those panels and it just showed how much attention the Victorians gave to their locomotives that they were painting and lining out so lovingly parts of the locomotive that actually wouldn't really be seen. And this was, by and large, a freight locomotive too. They did occasionally get loose on hot picker specials and the occasional bit of uh, passenger work, but primarily these were freight workhorses. Looking to the tender, one of the areas that has really struck me though is the tender drawbar. And I've gone on about this a lot. It's one that other manufacturers have sorted out, but Backman still persist in using this detachable pin and drawbar method, which puts a huge amount of strain on these wires, potentially. I do wish that they would employ the route that other companies have gone down in having these put together with a screw-on drawbar that just avoids the risk of pulling these wires out. If you do find yourself in a situation where they pull loose, well, you have my sympathies because that is not an easy fix in there. 
On the rest of the underside, well, the model does come with uh, brake rodding. If you wish to fit them, they are there in the detail pack, but I tend not to. Couplings are supplied front and back, and they fit into NEM pockets, and they are uh, equipped with the standard slimline NEM couplings. The front coupling is in the detail pack. I tend to add it because I find it's actually quite useful uh, operationally for a freight locomotive such as this, but you can leave it off if you so choose. We've got these really fine sanding pipes made out of a very springy metal, really nice to see. On other manufacturers' models, I see some of them are still using a plastic, which is very brittle and breaks easily, but Backman have gone the metal route and it is much the better for it. Looking towards the tender, We've got the cutout there for if you want to sound fit these locomotives. It does have space for a speaker in there. And indeed, that's where you will find the 21 pin socket that they come with as standard. I will be showing you how to get in there for DCC fitting at the end of this video. So if you want a little help with that, it's really easy peasy. Stay tuned for that. The brake blocks on the tender. This is an area which just looks a little bit peculiar to me. They're actually molded to the side frames and that means that they do not line up with any of the wheels. And it's just a little gripe which once you notice it, you can't unnotice it. And it does seem in this day and age to be a little bit of a retrograde step, but it's not a deal clincher. Buffers front and back are sprung loaded, fine turned metal examples, and they are really nicely done. It's got a factory applied three link coupling on there, which does actually feel robust enough that you could use that if that is the route you want to go. But it does tend to get in the way of the tension lock coupling if you choose to add that as I have here. There's also a vacuum hose factory applied, and you can see the rest of the front face is really nicely captured. Now, I believe I reviewed uh, this model quite some time ago now. Indeed, it's been out seven years, and it has always been a really good model, but it just feels a little bit like the seven years have not let it age well. It's still the same model that it was seven years ago, but we've had so many amazing fine detailed locomotives come through since that it does feel that there are elements on here that I can't quite place my finger on. I guess those brake blocks on the tender are one um, that if it had been a new release model now, it would have had a little bit more something somewhere. It's really hard to tell, but it does feel that this is a seven year old model. Turning to the upper levels of it, we can see that the, the boiler is nicely molded. There's no real parting line on there. And the uh, safety valves on there are really exquisitely done. We've got a turned metal whistle and also some additional pipe work. And then we've got the separately applied metal handrails going around the boiler across the front of the smoke box. They're also on the cab sides. And turning to the back of the tender, we've also got them across the back and down the sides of the tender. These seem to be left in this sort of brass, nickel, silver, very bright work way. And it just strikes me as, again, something of a retrograde step because the original had darkened rails. How do I know, you may be asking? That was a very difficult locomotive to get. Well, part of this video is comparing the two. This here is the original release from seven years ago. I was lucky enough to be able to get one. I pre-ordered it, and actually I was as surprised as everybody else that the, the price was really quite keen. She's a little bit dusty, but you can see there instantly the difference between the two. The brass work is slightly golder on the older model. I'm looking between them, and I think the newer one gets that shade much better. But these wire handrails don't look quite right on the new model for me. It looks like they forgot to blacken them for whatever reason. Now, is this true, truer to the prototype? I don't know. There aren't really any colour photographs of them from back in the day. So it would be really difficult to tell the difference between them being oily and that shine being picked up on black and white film and them being bright work such as this. So 
visually, aesthetically, for me, I prefer the older model. Anything else that I can see that's different? Well, actually the cab area is another area which really strikes me that there are some detailed differences going on in there. Again, the shade of gold stroke brass on the newer model I think is much better. It's not quite as gold, it's more brass, and I think that's exactly what it needs to be. You can also see that we've got this silver work on the inset in the cab sides that the original release didn't have. And again, it looks quite nice, like there's some attention to extra attention to detail going on there. If we turn to the front of the tender, we can also see that the handbrake standard is nicely picked out and finished on the newer release, whereas on the older version it's just left in this dark body colour and it's just little tiny details like that that do bring it to the fore. On the older model, I'm turning it over, it of course has exactly the same tender drawbar method. It has those brake blocks that don't line up with the tender wheels, but everything else it's pretty much the same and I'm just looking over there we've got the the metal sanding pipes in there they do get bent out of shape that's just seven years of it being used that's bent them it's still got the sprung buffers and let's just take a look at those buffers it looks like the newer loco has them in a more burnished color which I actually do prefer the older model has them slightly darker and I I think actually the burnished finish does work a lot better. As for the actual tampo printing, it looks slightly sharper on those boiler bands on the original release. Now that may be that if they've reused the tampo blocks, they've worn a little bit. They've also had seven years of storage. And it just, that yellow and the green look like they've blurred a little bit more on there. It's quite difficult to tell, but yeah, it's not quite as sharp as on the original release. And that's a shame, really, because the rest of the livery application, if I turn these side on, where we look to the lining on the tender, on the cab sides, and on the splashers, that all looks really, really nice. We've also got a pretty sharp works plate. And looking at that, actually, we flip the other way. The works plate on the newer release looks sharper. The old one just has this slightly dull effect to it. And I'm not really quite sure what's going on there. Also, when we're side on, we can see there's more of the detail on the Westinghouse air pump and some of the other boiler clack fittings there that are picked out on the newer release, which are not so on the old one. The old one, however, has the copper piping done in copper, whereas the new one, that looks almost like they've forgotten to paint it, or at least used a colour which, yeah, it's been left painted in the boiler colour, almost like they've forgotten to do that bit of the finishing. When it comes to the tenders though, the older release looks a lot sharper. You can see there, especially around the frames, that gold leaf colour just looks a bit more vibrant, so I think the older release just edges it on that. We do have some other detail differences, such as the handrails on there are picked out in this sort of silvery colour on the new release, where they're not so on the old. And again, that back of the cab is picked out with that silvery colour, all nicely done. All in all, I wouldn't say that it's a deal clincher between them. I do feel that this has been a long overdue release from Backman, and it's nice to see it turned back up in the range. The price is quite a lot more than that original release, and certainly prices across the board have been going up, not just from Backman, but from all manufacturers, and there's complex reasons for that. But this is a model that should have amortised its tooling by now. In seven years, it's had quite a lot of different releases, not just in the SECR livery, but also BR and Southern liveries too. And it just feels to me that a portion of the price now shouldn't be going towards paying off the tooling development costs. And it just, 
I don't know, my gut feeling is that the prices have gone up faster than perhaps they should be doing. It's a really complex area, and I know that the manufacturers would have a lot of very good arguments as to why the prices have had to go up. I truly believe that the original release was undervalued at the time of its release, and Backman charged too little for it, and I know that is a peculiar concept, but certainly I think they've perhaps gone a little bit too far the other way with the new release. Would I buy these models? Yes, I think I would. I'm a stickler for pre-grouping liveries, and there's so many people who lost out with the first release that these are certainly going to go down well. So I'm going to show you now the DCC fitting for this locomotive, and it's pretty easy. I'm going to put the old one to one side. They're all exactly the same, so what works on a new one works on the old one, and vice versa. The socket is in the tender. Now, with this, what we've got to do is it's a little bit, um, a little bit tricky to make sure you get the right screws. We've got one there at the back, just make sure that that's loose, and then these two can be the really tricky ones because they are so, so tiny. You don't want to strip the thread, so just push down with a gentle force and uh, you'll just feel that the screwdriver is into the head and then it just frees up. So I got them out. The tender top then just wiggles all the way free. Now, this locomotive has already been DCC fitted uh, by Tim's Trains before he very, very generously supplied this to us. The DCC decoder that we recommend for these is the Trainomatic 21 pin. So what you'll see in here is there'll be a blanking plate onto the 21 pin header. All you need to do is gently lever it free. What I suggest is you do it very gently with a flathead screwdriver and just loosen it one side at a time. Don't just yank it out from one side because you'll bend all of the pins and that can make it very, very difficult to impossible, depending on how much you damage them, to get a new pin in. If you wish to sound fit this locomotive, I've had great success with TTS sound chips and you'll need an 8-pin to 21-pin adapter. But if you have a 21-pin sound chip, that just plugs in as per standard. And then these two solder points here are where you would actually solder the speaker to. Now on the underside of the tender you can see the holes there for where the speaker sound would come out and the speaker itself goes underneath this plate which is removed just by undoing these two and lifting out. Once you've got everything installed in place it's really quite easy to get it all back together. Take the tender top, push it down the right way round and then it's just a reverse of that process. And what I find with these is it's often best to preload the screwdriver if you can. You may find a small pair of tweezers are sometimes helpful, but be warned. Sometimes they are not because they will get in the way of the screwdriver. These two are the trickiest. They are tiny and you must be ever so careful not to damage the thread. Only do them to the point where you can feel a little bit of resistance. They do not require over tightening at all. Otherwise, if you strip the thread, they will no longer hold the tender top in place. And if you seize them up, then you're unlikely to be able to easily get the tender top off in the future, should that need to happen. And that really is all that you need to do to DCC fit this loco. Then it's onto the programming track. The default is always three for these decoders, and then you can reprogram it to any number that you choose. With this particular one, 
I recommend the running number on the side, which is 583, and that just makes it a lot easier at a glance to work out which locomotive is what number. Finally, to the scores. First up, to the finish. Now, the original release was, in my view, almost perfect. It was so far in advance of anything that we'd seen before, but that was back in 2013. As we outlined in the uh, review, there are certain aspects which I feel that have become a little bit worse than before. Those boiler bands just don't look quite right. It's like the yellow and the green have smudged together a little bit. They don't have the sharpness of the original release. But swings and roundabouts, I also feel that the brass colour that they've used is slightly better than before. And then we get to the handrails, and these feel like they've just forgotten to finish them. On the original, they were dark in black and they just looked right. These, it's like we're going back to the 1980s a little bit with that toy-like bare metal. There's also areas on the pipework. That pipe that heads off down there to the front of the smoke box just feels like they forgot to finish it. On this model, you can see it's picked out in the brass colour. Here, even the boiler bands are painted across it. It's like they forgot a process. The tender lighting, though, is sharper on the new model, and we've also got some of this extra detail picked out here, here, and also up at the front of the boiler, here. And so it's like they've made more of an effort in some places and not quite as much effort in others. So for finish, I'm going to give this model an 8.8 .8 out of 10. Second up, we've got functionality. And actually, this locomotive runs really, really well. It was well balanced right from the start, and I found them to be a faultless runner. I've had this for seven years, and I've had two others as well for nearly as long, and they have all performed faultlessly, not needing anything in the way of maintenance, and I've had no quality control issues with them at all. So for functionality, I'm going to give this a 9.1 out of 10. Ease of use, principally DCC fitting. On all of these, it's really easy to get into that tender. We've got the three screws and the top just lifts out. There's no clips trying to uh, foil you in every way. It just comes apart and there is the socket. We've also got space in there for a sound decoder and speaker. It's the full package. There really isn't anything much to fault. The only thing I would say is that those screws at the front are tiny and they can be quite fiddly. So I'm gonna give this a 9.5 out of 10. Aesthetics. This really is a beautiful little locomotive. For a workaday workhorse of the uh, early Edwardian period, these things really do hold their own and look so businesslike when they're running. There isn't really a lot to fault with them. The lining is exquisite, notwithstanding some of the uh, the bits and pieces that I've, I've pointed out already. And really, there doesn't feel to me to be much to detract other than those handrails just don't look quite right for me in that bare metal. So for aesthetics, I'm going to give it a 8.9 out of 10. It would have scored higher, but that those it's those handrails. For me, it keeps coming back to the handrails. They stick out. In my opinion, if we had been reviewing this model with its blacked out handrails, I would have had no hesitation to go as high as a 9.5 out of 10. The final point is value for money. On the original, value for money was fairly and squarely in the 10 out of 10. At the price that it was released at, it was just incredible value for such an ornate and well-finished locomotive, and there really wasn't much to put a foot wrong. But when we come to the modern release, the price has nearly tripled, and there's just a few elements that feels like they overlooked things. For me, again, boiler handrails but also this this uh, pipe or rod that goes and extends diagonally across the boiler it just feels like they forgot a process to finish it and once you see that 
it becomes painfully obvious. Yes, I know that there's a greater attention to detail with some of the other fittings, but it just feels hurried, like they didn't quite do all the processes. So for value for money, with that huge price tag as well, I'm afraid this locomotive for me only scores a 6.4 out of 10. That brings us to the final overall score. And well, it's still a respectable 42.7 out of 50. But the model dropped principally for me off the back of a lack of certain bits feeling as though they'd been finished and also these these garish metallic bare handrails and the high price now i understand that there are legitimate reasons for prices to go up and a lot of reviewers on youtube do bang on again and again about price but if the manufacturers can justify it then i believe it is firm and fair but with this model it feels to me that the tooling has already been amortised, so the R&D and the tool manufacturing costs shouldn't really play a part, and that should have helped to keep the prices down. But with the 2020 release schedule, what we have instead seen is a huge mark-up of the price from the previous releases, which uh, were actually still available for under £100. And it just struck me as odd, as I said when the Backman announcements came through, that the C-Class was one of their flagship locomotive releases for the 2020 uh, release schedule, and they released it in a near-identical livery to the one that was still available in all the shops at a markup of nearly £100 over what the previous price had been. And I just haven't seen evidence from Backman yet to fully justify that. Yes, in part, there are reasons that push up the price, but until Backman can come out and say exactly why and where, I don't feel that that full price has yet been justified. Would I buy this model? Yes, I think I still would. I have a great soft spot for the SECR livery and I think a lot of people who missed out on the original release will take a view that even at the £189 that this is available from the model shops at, that's a lot less than the £550 that this model was changing hands comparatively recently on an online auction site. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that video and thank you for taking your time out to watch this review with me, Jenny Kirk. Don't forget as well that you can head on over to Patreon and you can help to support the channel and help us to make the videos that you really, really like. And uh, also don't forget to like the video, share it too. That's really important. Let everybody else know about the stuff that we're doing here on this channel. And if you've got any ideas for future videos, then don't forget you can leave them down in the comments below. Really would love to hear from you. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying you take really good care of yourself. You stay safe now and uh, see you next time. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic. Makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk, Tepic, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian Smith, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, and Judge Mortis. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.